knives, fire, speeding down the sidewalk. Our children seem to be drawn to all of these risky activities. And wherever we look, there's danger signs, warning and alarm bells going off in our heads to keep them safe. We've all got the helmets and the seat belts down pat. It's great news that child mortality is down and childhood safety is up. But there are some really crucial things we have to know as parents. I'm Avital, welcome to the Parenting Junkie Show, the place to be to love parenting and parent from love. I want you to think back to your own childhood, to a memory of a time that you were really excited and proud of yourself and you got lost and then found your way, mastered some skill like lighting a match for the first time or a time that you went somewhere on your own. Taking risks is often a core component in our most cherished childhood memories. Why is that? In our culture, all of us adults keep trying to make it safer and safer and bubble wrap our children. Playgrounds used to be truly risky places where you could really push yourself. You could climb to very great heights. Contrast that to today's playgrounds, which are really almost boring, because they're so safe. What we're missing out on is the fact that through challenging, risky play, physical strengths are gained. In our culture, we think that play is for fun. Play is just what you do when you're not busy doing everything else. But children develop by playing, by pushing themselves through play. They do this in social emotional skills and academic skills and in their balance, their core strength. All of these things are heavily influenced by their capacity for and the time that they're allowed to take risks. Think about how much risk is involved in adult life. We all have to drive a car, cook with fire, chop vegetables, or emotional and financial risks, getting married or investing in the stock market. Children gradually grow into maturity and into adulthood, and they need to be allowed to practice those skills throughout their childhood from when they take their first steps and risk falling down and all the way through to learning to use a knife, to ride a bike. We can't learn without pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone into something that is unknown territory where we might get hurt either physically or emotionally. Learning your body limits and developing your coordination and your motor skills is actually a natural development that happens when kids are allowed to take physical risks, especially in the great outdoors. When they're allowed to climb, ride their bikes, to rough and tumble. Another reaction us parents or teachers sometimes have is to help them to avoid risk. We think, oh no, they're gonna get hurt. We need to protect them. We need to stop them from doing these things. But risk avoidance actually teaches us timidity. All of those skills won't develop unless we're given the opportunity to actually put ourselves at a bit of risk. It can be a vicious cycle. Say you're scared to let your child learn to use a knife. You stop them from using a knife. They don't ever use a knife and therefore you're scared of them using a knife. We need to halt that cycle and reverse it. In her book, Balanced and Barefoot, Angela Hanscom deeply researches this topic and shares with us that one of the main reasons there's a rise in sensory issues in children can be directly linked to their lack of time just spent outdoors in free play. Only one in two children today have the same level of core strength and balance that children typically had back in 1980. There are a lot of muscle control issues for children today. This is directly caused by the fact that children are sedentary in a seated and directed lifestyle. Kids today aren't climbing trees, swinging on the merry-go-round or hanging upside down on the monkey bars. We think that we're protecting them, but this uprightness of their lifestyle directed by adults is causing a whole host of other problems. Hanscom and her colleagues are seeing a huge increase in lack of balance, lack of attention, tension, lack of emotional self-regulation, and an increase in aggression in their patients. These symptoms are due in part to underdeveloped motor and sensory skills, which leave children underprepared for academics and overwhelmed by daily life and social situations. Physiologically, when we don't use our bodies in other ways other than just being upright, such as tumbling, rolling down a hill, spinning around, doing cartwheels, then we actually lose our abilities to do those things. The liquid in our inner ear actually 
thickens, which is why as adults, we find it much less comfortable to go upside down. Now, we should and must use common sense and law-abiding rules when it comes to safety for our children. You know what's best for your child, and of course, not all risks are appropriate for all ages and stages by any means. Perhaps isn't engaging in some risky and physically stretching activities one very good tutorial for keeping them safe in the long run. If you're cooking with fire and you get a little burn, it's not what any parent wants, but you're very unlikely to make that mistake again. You've learned on your own independently. If a parent just stands there lecturing at you, are you going to really internalize that message? That's why children are actually drawn to dangerous things. They're actually wired to seek out reasonable risks within their culture and to master them. Why would children the world over be drawn to such behaviors? Let me ask you a question. Are your children drawn to risk or were you drawn to risk when you were a child? Did you do anything dangerous? I would love to hear from you what kind of risk is going on in your family. Please let me know by heading over to theparentingjunkie.com forward slash blog and leaving me your comment. I read everyone and I would love to hear your stories there. Now let's get back into this. Evolutionarily speaking, why would risky play be selected for in our species? Why hasn't natural selection weeded it out? Risk is incredibly important for our children's safety. If you never put a baby on the floor, and I know parents who don't because the floor is dirty and jammy and the baby might not love it, then they won't learn to crawl. And if they don't learn to crawl, it's gonna be harder to then learn to walk. That's what it takes. Humans, like a few other mammals, have really long childhoods. And animals who have longer childhoods are actually more intelligent. They have more complicated skills and social structures. The longer the childhood, the longer the time to play, the longer the time to develop skills. Baby monkeys, for example, they're swinging from the treetops and they're gonna each time push themselves a little further to swing just out of reach so that they grow their skills and become adult monkeys who can properly swing. So when your child is climbing and you're drawn to say, be careful, be careful, just ask yourself, isn't that what I want? Shouldn't I be supremely grateful that my child is interested and able-bodied enough to do this? How can you help your children take meaningful and reasonable risks throughout their childhood? Three ideas for you. Number one, stop saying, be careful. When we see a child doing something that we think is risky, our go-to is usually something like, hey, 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 Johnny, 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 Johnny. Be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. And I get it, I do that too. But I wanna break this down for you for a moment because saying be careful might not be the most helpful thing in that scenario. I want you to imagine that you're doing something that's a little bit dangerous. Maybe you're trying to move lanes on the highway and the traffic is coming by fast. Your partner's sitting next to you and so helpfully saying, be careful, be careful, be careful, as you indicate and you're checking your mirrors and you're trying to move lanes and merge. I think we can both agree that it's not helpful. However, if your partner sat there and gave you some kind of useful information that you had missed, such as there's a truck in your blind spot, that would be helpful, right? Look for information that might be useful for your child, such as that floor is wet, you're wearing sandals, shoes would be better. Telling them useful information will help them, but saying be careful won't. You can also ask your child, do you feel safe? This is a great question to ask because rather than telling them they're not safe, we're teaching them to start to take the onus of responsibility over their safety on themselves. You are a trustworthy individual who has common sense in the world and I trust you and I'm here as your guide to help you develop that. It's also important for you, the parent, because if the child feels safe, they're much more likely to behave sure-footedly and actually be safe. Finally, instead of be careful, you can share vulnerably of your own feelings. I feel nervous about that trick you're trying to do. Can you talk me through your plan? You're in a relationship and it matters if you feel nervous and that they can tell you what precautions they're gonna be taking, how they're gonna make sure that they're staying safe. Number two, 
keep your own feelings in check. I'm a parent too, and yes, accidents can happen sitting on our couch at home or driving our car. It wouldn't work for most of us to never go on public transportation, never fly in a plane, never drive a car, or never cook in the kitchen because there are risks associated with those things. What I'm really suggesting is that we embrace the fact that risk is part of life and we need to keep our own anxieties in check around our children, not make them feel that the world is a dangerous place. It's okay to say, oh, I can't watch, but go for it, have fun. But the truth is that fear doesn't lead into logical, common sense, healthy risk assessment and evaluation. What helps us is good information and confidence to try and sometimes make errors and learn along the way. Number three, seek opportunities for risky play. And I mean actively look out and seek opportunities where your children can take risks. They're increasingly rare in our culture. One of my favorite authors, Dr. Peter Gray, has taught me of six really important categories of risky play that all children seek out universally in every culture. Isn't that amazing? Let me share them with you. And what I'm gonna do is take it one step further and give you an example of ways you can easily introduce this type of risk into your children's lives if they're seeking it out too. Great heights. Universally, children seek to climb high, both physically and metaphorically, but let's stay in the body for now, shall we? So climbing high, this should be something that's relatively easy to find opportunities for your children to be allowed to do. Just put a great pair of shoes on and allow them to climb. If you have to walk behind them, fine. Just don't hover and make it seem like it's the most dangerous thing ever. Allow them to climb to great heights. Rapid speeds. I know this one's a little tough, but how about we get on our helmets, get on our knee pads, our elbow pads, whatever kind of thing you need, take them to a safe space and allow them to ride their bikes or scooters or rollerblades or skateboards as fast as they like. Going fast, really important rite of passage for risky play in childhood. Dangerous tools. Yep, across the world, children want to use dangerous tools, i.e. real, heavy, metal, sharp, adult tools. We give them the plastic knockoffs and think that they'll enjoy playing Bob the Builder. They need the real weight in their hand and the real satisfaction of using a tool that isn't a toy. You can get child size real tools. You can teach them how to use saws, knives, hammers. The point is slowly and carefully introduce them to that with a lot of trust and a lot of guidance. For younger kids, you can get Montessori knives, you can get plastic knives. I'll link up to those below. But slowly and surely, you do want to progress them into using regular knives as well. Whittling wood, carving wood, cutting vegetables, chopping a watermelon. These are great and sometimes helpful activities for you as well. Dangerous elements. Children the world over are attracted to fire, to smoke, to water into great bodies of water. We want to say, no, don't touch, don't go there. And of course we must keep them safe, but we also want to teach them how to manipulate these elements and teach them how to master them. So teaching kids how to light matches, how to maybe start a fire in nature and how to be safe as well. Rough and tumble play. All over the world, kids want to play rough and tumble. They want to do pillow fights, they want to do play fighting. And in our culture, it's all about no hands, no touching each other, gentle hands, hands to yourself. And I get it. We need to allow children to do that and just help them with the guidelines and with troubleshooting when the conflict gets a little too rough. In our home, for example, we love to play the sock game from Dr. Lawrence Cohen, who wrote, playful parenting. And that game is where everybody wears a pair of socks and we all get on the floor and the aim of the game is to get someone else's socks off without losing your own socks. So there's no scratching, hitting, biting, kicking or anything like that. There's a lot of rough and tumble going on and it's so much fun. Just teach them that they can't actually hurt the other person and always give them a safety word such as halt if they wanna stop the game. But other than that, it's important to let them play fight. Disappearing or getting lost. 
This is one more theme in risky play that children the world over are interested in. From the time your toddler tries to run out into the street behind you or into a crowd of people, to the time that your 12 year old wants the independence of going to school by themselves. That's why they love the game hide and seek, where you get that thrill of I'm alone, maybe no one will find me, maybe they'll never know where I am. And that's what getting lost theme is all about. It's not about really getting lost, but it's about disappearing for a time. Just that rush of being away from adult supervision eyes for a few moments even is really important to developing that tolerance. When children are allowed to take reasonable risks, they actually become safer because their ability to assess risk, to use critical thinking and common sense, and to troubleshoot when problems arise are increased through the risks that they've taken. All of their experience lends to them trusting in their own bodies and developing confidence and sure-footedness. This is how we hopefully raise children who are resilient, who aren't seeking risks because they were never allowed to take any risks, but also who aren't timid and shy and scared of the big bad world. This is how we raise kids who are reasonable, thoughtful, mindful risk takers, who aren't too timid or too ballsy for their own good. Hey, have you tuned in to the Parenting Junkie podcast yet? I am so grateful to all of you who are leaving incredible reviews over on iTunes. Thank you so much for keeping the Parenting Junkie show in the top 10 of the iTunes kids and family category for consecutive months in a row. You don't want to miss it out. So go over to anywhere you get your podcasts and tune into the Parenting Junkie show. We'll go deeper into this topic there. Now is the time to share this episode out with anyone who you think it might help and just slam on that subscribe and like button so that this can be more discoverable for other parents. I would love to invite you over to Instagram at Parenting Junkie. You can tag me in your story, share out this episode, screenshot it, or leave me your comment over at theparentingjunkie.com forward slash blog. I would love to hear from you and hear how this sits with you. Is it hard for you to allow your children to take risks? What are you nervous about when it comes to risky play?